So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about the Boston Tea Party, one of history's greatest protests. And I should mention that, as with all videos here on Geographics, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. In particular, James CJ, whose social links can be found below if you're so inclined. Also, I would like to point out, you know, I am, I am English. We're talking about the Boston Tea Party, so, you know, get, get, go down to the comments and hit me with your best, like, you know, bad English jokes or Boston Tea Party jokes. I'll get you started. Um, uh, you know, how does an American make the tea? By dumping it in the harbour. And in that vein, I've also got myself a nice cup of char here to enjoy while doing the, um, uh, the video itself. Let's get to it. So before America gained independence from the British, the situation in the colonies was steadily deteriorating. The 1770s was the most crucial decade for the start of US history, a series of events that would push America to seek independence from the British and propel the cause forward, leading to the American Revolution. One of the events that holds extreme significance in America's quest for liberation from Britain occurred in Boston, colonial Massachusetts, known as the Boston Tea Party. It's by no means the only event that set off the revolution, but it stands out for many reasons. One of history's most famous protests, the Boston Tea Party, was a carefully orchestrated demonstration aimed at making the colonists' disdain towards the British government and its laws well known. It did so in undeniable style and helped shore up support among the colonists to leave Britain behind and start their own country with its own laws and a separate government. This is the story of the Boston Tea Party, a protest of substance and style that achieved undeniable things, including advancing revolutionary sentiment. In the 17th century, the British discovered tea and began consuming it excessively, something we continue to do to this day. So tea became extremely popular among the British, profoundly affecting England's economy and mannerisms. The biggest benefactor of this newfound product was the East India Trading Company, which British government granted a monopoly over the tea trade to in 1698. Tea consumption and popularity eventually spread to the British colonies, one being America. Great Britain extended the East India Trading Company's power over the colonial tea trade with the Act of 17 1821, which ensured they'd be the only ones able to sell tea to the colonies. This act meant that they could sell tea wholesale at auctions to British firms who sold it to American merchants. Unfortunately, this act did little to curb the existence of tea smugglers, bringing in over £900,000 of tea a year at its peak, roughly three quarters of all tea imported. The smuggling issue was a result of Great Britain's taxation methods. Their 25% ad valorem tax and the additional taxes imposed upon the citizens of Great Britain and its colonies meant that smuggling smuggling tax-free tea from Holland was far cheaper than just buying it at one of these auctions. America might have been slow to catch on to tea, but by the 1760s they consumed over a million pounds of it annually. However, nobody knew that tea would be at the centre of one of history's most potent and famous protests. <laughs> In the 1760s, Britain was experiencing a, shall we say, tumultuous economic crisis. The Seven Years' War, which had ended in 1763, had decimated their coffers. As a result, they decided that their colonies were their best shot at shoring up their reserves of cash. The best choice for improving their revenue stream was through taxation, so they began taxing the ever-loving out of colonists in numerous ways, starting with the infamous Stamp Act. So the purpose of the Stamp Act was not only to build up revenue for Britain, but also fund Britain's efforts in the colonies, like maintaining regiments of British soldiers posted to keep peace in the colonies and with Native Americans. They'd achieve this tax by using stamps to represent it, which would be on various forms, documents, papers, playing cards, etc. Almost immediately after the learning of the Stamp Act, the colonists argued that it was unconstitutional, as only the colony representatives could tax them. The Stamp Act also included a clause that stated violations of this new law would be tried and convicted void of a jury because colonial juries were notorious for not convicting smugglers. Naturally, the British Parliament had no faith they'd adequately convict violators of the recently passed tax law as well. The reactions elicited by the announcement of the Stamp Act was primarily protests and objections from legislative bodies across the colonies. When the law went into effect, protest turned to violence. Mob violence broke out amongst the colonies and stamp collectors were driven out with threats and violence. This was partly at the recommendation of the colonies, whose own legislative 
legislative bodies had passed amendments calling on the people to resist the tax burden. Britain eventually caved while the law was passed in 1765. It was repealed less than a year later. This was also around when the Sons of Liberty formed, which would become the masterminds behind the Boston Tea Party. Under their command, a mob tore through Boston with an effigy of the stamp distributor, which they proceeded to hang from a tree and then behead. They then ransacked the stamp collector's home and forced him to agree to resign from his post, which I imagine was really easy to do when you can point outside to the baying mob cutting off an effigy of you's head that's hung from a tree. Britain had created its own downfall, but in fairness, that was the case long before the Stamp Act. Hey! After repealing the Stamp Act, the British Empire reaffirmed its power to pass any laws on the colonists they saw fit. The problem was that the colonists had made it apparent that they had all the power. Because the Sons of Liberty's efforts in getting the majority of the stamp distributors and collectors to resign, their ability to stop stamp papers from being discharged from the ship's cargoes, the burning of stamps they had collected, and mass protests, they made it impossible for the Act to ever be implemented. This was an issue that was only the beginning, and it would fester for a decade before detonating in Britain's face. With the downfall of the Stamp Act, Britain was ready to show the colonists that it could impose its authority over them however it saw fit. Named after Charles Townsend, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Townsend's Acts were a series of acts with each having a different part to play in Britain imposing of laws and taxes on the colonists. The laws were in response to Benjamin Franklin's declaration that the colonies intended to start manufacturing goods to avoid paying the high duties on imports. The primary purpose of the Act, at least the advertised purpose, was to raise revenue, but Townsend saw this as an opportunity to remodel the colonies and their local governments to better suit the needs of Great Britain. All of the acts were passed throughout 1767, with the first act being the Quartering Act, which required local governments to foot the bill for British presence in the colonies through taxation. The Revenue Act came next, the tax on certain imports to raise money for the British Treasury. This was the most important of the series of laws, as it implemented a tax on items like china, lead, glass, paper, paint, and of course, tea. It's estimated that the import duties would generate well in excess of £40,000 in revenue, primarily from tea. The Commissioners of Customs Act of 1767 came into effect to enforce the new shipping regulations required for all of this stuff. By July 2nd, 1767, the two new Townsend Acts were passed. The first was the New York Restraining Act, which suspended the New York Assembly until they complied with the Quartering Act. The second act was the Indemnity Act, which reduced the East India Company's tax burden on tea importing, making it cheaper for them to sell. The final act was the Vice Admiralty Court Act of 1768. This act focused on prosecuting smugglers, giving Admiralty Courts during jurisdiction over all customs violations. This took the power away from colonial courts and meant that the Crown appointed judges were the sole deciders of a custom violator's fate. And just to stick the boot in, they made it exceedingly difficult for those accused of this crime to be found innocent, with only three courts available in Charleston, Philadelphia and Boston, to which the defendants had to pay to go to out of their own pocket, and if they didn't appear, they were found guilty by default. The combination of these laws started mass protests throughout the colonies, with one getting extremely violent. As one might imagine, the response to the Townsend's Acts was volatile. The first of these acts only went into effect on November 20th, 1767, but the British Parliament had already angered colonists with the recently passed Declaratory Act of 1766. This stated that British Parliament had the same power over the colonies as they did back in Great Britain regarding taxation. And of all the words I mispronounced there, I mispronounced the name of the country in which I live. I am terrible. Protests erupted throughout the colonies with the influential Sons of Liberty circulating documents promoting the boycott of British goods. Through the work of the Sons of Liberty, over 24 towns in Rhode Island, Connecticut and Massachusetts agreed to the terms of the boycott in 1768. New York eventually joined the boycott and non-essential goods weren't imported from Britain for over a year. By now, it was blatantly clear that the tensions had been riding high for several years between the colonists and the British. In response to the disobedience to these various acts, more troops were sent to Boston, resulting in over 2,000 troops policing a city of just 16,000. The soldiers attempted to enforce these various laws passed by the British, thus creating ever yet more friction with the colonists. Eventually, protests, vandalising of stores selling British goods and intimidation against merchants and customers became fairly common occurrences. Things finally boiled over and resulted in a more horrific event that changed the course of history. 
the Boston Massacre. Before the massacre, though, an incident on February 22nd, 1770 would lead to an altercation that set the stage for the forthcoming historic massacre. The incident occurred when a group of patriots went after a loyalist store. In an attempt to break up the mob, a customs officer fired a gun through a window of his home, killing an 11-year-old boy called Christopher Seder, which only made matters worse. A few days later, another fight broke out between soldiers and local workers, and while this didn't end in severe bloodshed, it was a precursor to something far worse. On a snowy night, March 5th, 1770, one lone soldier was guarding the king's money, stored inside the customs house on the aptly named King Street. Eventually, colonists came to the customs house throwing insults and threats of violence at Private Hugh White. It didn't take long for things to escalate with White fighting back by striking a colonist with his bayonet. This caused the colonists to start pelting the soldiers with snowballs, stones, ice, and pretty much anything else they could get their hands on. Eventually, White called for backup until Captain Thomas Preston came with soldiers and surrounded the customs house. There was a slight pause as the fear of bloodshed became clear. Colonists were split, with some pleading to hold fire and others coaxing them into firing. Tempers flared and tensions continued to rise until all hell broke loose. Colonists began striking the soldiers with sticks and clubs and a soldier fired his gun. Whether this was intentional or accidental is still unknown to this day. Regardless, as far as the soldiers were concerned, as the shot rang out, it permitted the other soldiers to open fire, killing five colonists in the process. The Boston Massacre had been fomenting for a while. Sure, it could have gone one of several different ways, but the main point was a fight between soldiers and the colonists, and it was a long time coming. As if it was needed, the Boston Massacre only fueled anti-British sentiment in the colonies. Preston and his fellow soldiers were arrested, and both sides began a relentless propaganda campaign. Preston told his side of the story from jail, and the Sons of Liberty pushed for continued disobedience. In the end, Preston, indeed, almost every soldier that day was found not guilty and allowed to walk free. The only two people to be convicted of any crime were Private Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy, who were convicted of manslaughter. As you might expect, colonists were none too pleased with this result, and the growing anti-British sentiment was palpable. And things were about to reach their boiling point. Over the course of a few months, the Townsend's Acts were mostly repealed, but one thing remained the same the tax on tea. While the idea of a colonial boycott died down, many colonists refused to buy and consume tea as a result of the tax remaining in place. And if they were consuming tea, it was more often than not smuggled Dutch tea they hadn't paid any taxes on. The British East India Company was financially struggling during this time. The loss of tea sales due to smuggling wasn't really helping. And few things speak to the almost unfathomable amount of power and influence wielded by the East India Trading Company, more than the fact that this brief economic downturn actually threatened the economy of Great Britain as a whole. In response, on May 10th, 1773, the British Parliament passed the Tea Act. And this act gave the East India Company power to sell the 17 million pounds of tea they had stored in England by underselling the products, beating their competitors. While the import rate remained the same, the company was no longer required to pay the additional taxes, resulting in the lower price of tea in the colonies. But cheaper tea didn't have the effect the British Parliament had hoped for. Tea smuggling actually increased, even though the tea eventually became more expensive than imported tea. But thanks to Samuel Adams and John Hancock, prolific smugglers and ardent protesters against taxation without representation, colonists continued to buy smuggled tea just to stick it to the British. They actually paid more money just to stick it to us in blight it, which you know what? Respect. The Sons of Liberty was an interesting patriot paramilitary political organisation whose origins remain relatively unknown even to this day. However, they began during the aftermath of the Stamp Act passing. There were many chapters throughout the colonies. However, the Boston chapter might be one of the most impactful and influential to American history. Made up of notable historical figures like the aforementioned Samuel Adams and John Hancock, they also included figures as noteworthy as Patrick Henry, Benedict Arnold, yes, that Benedict Arnold, Paul Revere, and more. The Boston chapter frequently met on under a liberty tree in the dark of night, and the Sons of Liberty had many big and small achievements in setting up and likely causing the American Revolution as a whole. They made the Stamp Act nearly impossible to implement and instigated disdain for the British. Of course, us, us Brits have a tendency to make that part quite easy. Building up to the infamous Boston Tea Party, the Sons of Liberty, led by Sam Adams, rallied against the docking of the Dartmouth, which was an East India Company ship carrying tea set to arrive in Griffin's Wharf. By December 16th, 1773, Dartmouth was accompanied by Eleanor and Beaver, 
two other vessels all carrying tea from China. Despite the colonists voting to refuse to pay taxes on the tea, allowing the tea to be unloaded, sold, stored or used in the colonies, Governor Thomas Hutchinson refused to let the ship leave until the tea tariff was paid and the tea was off the vessel. This only created more tension between colonists and the hands of power. This act of defiance from the governor in listening to his citizens gave the Sons of Liberty their biggest idea yet. They take direct action, just as they met in the Liberty Tree at night all those many times before. That night, while Boston was quiet, roughly 60 men made their way to Griffin's Wharf, made up of colonists and Sons of Liberty members. They were dressed in blankets and Native American headdresses. The group entered the harbour and boarded the Dartmouth, Eleanor and Beaver, where they went straight for the cargo the precious, precious tea. The group was instructed to open the 342 chest, take the tea and dump it directly into the harbour. The estimated value of the tea was around £18,000, which today would be equivalent to £3.4 million, close to $4.5 million. A participant named George Hughes stated, and I quote, we were surrounded by British armed ships, but no attempt was made to resist us. In a matter of three hours, the colonists dumped 45 tonnes of tea into the Boston Harbour. And this was by no means a small act of defiance. This was a deadly blow to the financial security of the East India Company, and in turn, the British Empire as a whole. And one of the more impressive things about this brazen protest is that it was so self-contained. It wasn't a case of pandemonium or hysteria. The tea was dumped and nothing else was destroyed. No shops were looted and the men simply returned home and awaited the consequences of their actions. Not as individuals, but as colonies. So the Sons of Liberty knew that the British would retaliate and maybe that's what they were hoping for. Like, us Brits do love us some tea, so destroying 45 tons of stuff was a surefire way to piss off someone higher up and maybe harsh retaliation is what they were looking for because without that kind of retaliation the colonists wouldn't have fought as hard to secure their freedom. They needed a pure reason to achieve the hatred against the British required to gain support for breaking free of the British Empire. They were about to get that and perhaps a little more. Not everybody was pleased with the Boston Tea Party event. Some were thrilled, like John Adams, a colonist leader. Others said one thing in public and another in private. Take notable US figure George Washington, you know, that George Washington, who in 1774 wrote, and I quote, the cause of Boston ever will be considered as the cause of America. However, his views personally were far different. See, George Washington was an elite, and like many elites, he had private property, which he deemed to be too risky and valuable to be toyed with. In private, he severely disapproved, even claiming that the Bostonians were mad to have done this. Benjamin Franklin, on the other hand, offered to reimburse the British Empire for the tea, but the damage was done. Regardless of anyone's opinions or offers, the British Empire was about to come down on the colonies with the intolerable acts, a set of acts that gave way to calls for independence. The British Empire responded, shall we say, firmly to the actions taken against them in the Boston Tea Party event by passing the Coercive Acts, better known as the Intolerable Acts. These four acts closed the harbour until the tea was fully paid for and ended the constitution in Massachusetts, cancelling free elections for town officials. It also moved the judicial authority to Britain and its judges, resulting in martial law in Massachusetts. One of the final acts was demanding colonists to quarter soldiers on demand. A further lesser known act, known as the Quebec Act, extended the freedom to worship the French Canadian Catholics, which didn't sit well well with the Protestants and was also counted as one of the Intolerable Acts. One crucial fact about the Intolerable Acts is that they weren't repealed unlike the Stamp and Townshead Acts. As a result, they helped sow the seeds for rebellion and eventually, revolution. The response to the Intolerable Acts was volatile to say the least, far more volatile than the response to the prior acts. All other colonies feared that while Massachusetts was taking the harsh punishment, it meant that Britain could do the same thing to them. As a result, all the colonies except for Georgia joined with Massachusetts in boycotting trade. These oppressive laws resulted in the meeting of the First Continental Congress attended by numerous founding fathers along with people like George Washington. When the blockade commenced on June 1st, 1774, it meant nothing came into the Boston's port except supplies for the army and necessary goods like wheat and fuel. These acts were meant to bring Massachusetts to its knees and act as a cautionary tale for the other colonies. Unfortunately, they had very much the opposite effect on the colonies. The Intolerable Act shifted public opinion far away from supporting the British Empire. There was even a second lesser known Boston Tea Party which once again saw 60 Bostonians boarding a ship, this one called the Fortune and Dumping, tea into the harbour 
again. This second, much smaller and less publicised protest only saw some 30 chests of tea being thrown into the harbour, but, you know, don't mess with the classics, and it did have the secondary effect of inspiring similar actions in South Carolina, New York and Maryland. This happened before the Continental Congress gathered. Still, it helped shore up support amongst the colonists to disobey the British and oppose their intense laws. Unfortunately, Britain had been inconsistent in their attempts at demonstrating its power, and they'd been creating a losing battle for well over a decade. The Continental Congress created the Declaration and Resolves by October 1774, censuring Britain for the coercive acts and demanding their repeal, establishing a boycott of British goods, declaring the right for the colonists to be independently governed, and rallied colonists to form a well-trained militia. Of course, Britain didn't back down, and within a matter of months in Lexington, the first shot was fired on the British, and the American Revolution began. Regardless of where anyone stands around the actions on December 16th, 1773, they are part of the reason the United States exists today. This act of defiance's goal was unclear. Was it purely a means to stick it to the British, which again, I support, or did the Sons of Liberty want them to respond so intensely that it would make the colonies closer to fighting for independence? Who knows? The reality is that it achieved both regardless. The Boston Tea Party remains a historic event in American history. It serves as the foundation for a bloody war that gave way to the United States of America, free from British rule. Without it, perhaps they would have made their way to independence anyway. But the only question is how much longer that would have taken. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Geographics. I hope you found it informative. I certainly did myself. And I'm probably more clued up on the American Revolution than most of my British compatriots because I did spend some time in Philadelphia visiting the American Revolutionary War Museum, where I learned that many Americans aren't as familiar with their own history as you'd expect, given how foundational it is to American history as a whole. So while walking around um, uh, that museum, there was a couple of exhibits that really surprised me, but more surprising to me still was that a lot of the Americans walking around the museum as well were also surprised by them. Uh, one of them was an exhibit, which I'm not sure if it still stands, it was about a decade ago I went now, but it was titled something along the lines of Freedom Wears a Red Coat, uh, which talked about how almost every slave the British encountered what, during their campaign across the colonies just joined with the British side because they were promised freedom. And something that has stuck with me to this day is that while I was like stood at that exhibit, reading about how all these slaves had ran away from uh, plantations and whatnot to join with the British, an American lady sidled up next to me, read through the exhibit, and just muttered under her breath to her husband, that's so un-American. And just, I was just astounded by that. Likewise, there was another exhibit about how um, near enough every one of the Native American tribes also sided with the British, um, because the British promised to restore their lands, whereas the colonists did not. And it's just a fascinating part of American history that I hope we can cover more in depth on this channel at a later date because I'd certainly enjoy reading those scripts. And if you've got any other ideas for, you know, um, uh, significant moments in history or geographical locations that you think deserve to be talked about more, let us know about them in the comments and we could pass them on to our writers to get some more scripts on those subjects. If you like the video, leave a like. If you've got, you know, you want to see more like this, you can subscribe for more. And as always, I'd like to wish everybody out there the day that they deserve.